Good afternoon and welcome to the first session of these mobile talks. And I'm calling this the first session uh, because even though we have hosted many talks in the past, we are now aspiring to a new era of talks. What you saw in this first video is a summary of some of the content we've been working on during these last few weeks. Instead of covering one topic in one session, the Mobile World Capital Foundation wanted to do something unusual during these times, to thoroughly analyze every single challenge that we are facing nowadays. We saw the support of extremely relevant professionals from all over the world to share their thought, provoking and reflective viewpoints in these videos. We will share some of this content during the session, but remember that you can find the full version of this, mobile, of this content in the Mobile World Capital website or on the digital platforms. The COVID-19 pandemic has caused an unprecedented situation worldwide. Well-established and consolidated societies with economic, social and cultural models have seen how everything with a firm position can break down and be called into question. There have been numerous implications and we have reacted as best as we could to an unknown and invisible enemy. This has had a fundamental role in changing consumption forever, with full-fledged direct and indirect implications in the 21st century. Sectors have been hit hard and professionals may never be able to go back to the job that they had before the outbreak of the virus. Others, on the other hand, have seen their businesses grow overnight. But are we only talking about professions of quality or are we talking about an increasingly marked polarization between first-rate jobs and second first-rate jobs? On the other hand, traditionally high traffic spaces such as supermarkets may need to change or not, we'll see, and defragment themselves by aligning with close, local and trust-based commerce. Nonetheless, even after almost a year of responsible and caution measures, people and employees have no idea if some sectors and leisure activities will prevail. What will happen, for example, to live music? Will young people be able to go back to what is typical of their age? Will we travel as we used to? Will that longed-for normality even return or is this turning point so prominent that it will change us forever? Whatever it is, will it change us for the better or will it be left in the bleak limbo? Today, we would like to explore and learn more about our future with regards to our consumption and our work, especially after realizing that so many sectors are facing the worst crisis of their time. That's why it is a privilege to do so with someone who is a professor at the London School of Economics and a Nobel Prize winner of economics in 2010, Christopher Pisaridis, but also with amazing professionals that are joining us in this session. To introduce properly Professor Pisaridis, it is an honor to welcome to, to this session to Mr. Jordi Wall, Chairman of CaixaBank. By the way, Mr. Wall, thank you very much to CaixaBank for being able or for being part of this Mobile World Capital Foundation and especially for supporting these mobile talks. Dr. Jordi Wall holds a PhD in economics from the University of California at Berkeley and is a professor of economics at the ESA Business School and a research fellow at the Center for Economic Policy Research in London. Among other responsibilities and in addition to being the chairman of CaixaBank, he's a member of the board of directors of Telefonica and of the supervisory group at the Erst Group Bank. He's chairman of the public policy think tank FIDEA, vice president of Cotec Foundation for Innovation and member of the board of this mobile, uh, Barcelona Mobile World Capital Foundation. Mr. Well, um, it's an honor and uh, the floor is yours. I think you're muted, um, Mr. Wall. That's normal. Good afternoon. I did it. Good too. afternoon. Sorry for that. <laughs> the floor well, is Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, and thanks for your introductory words. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, welcome to those attending uh, all, all this event. Uh, my congratulations and thanks to Dr. Pisarides for being with us, and also to the rest of uh, the members of the distinguished table, round table that we will have after the presentation of Dr. Pesarides. For me, it's an honor to present uh, today's initiative. Uh, we are a proud partner of the uh, Mobile World Capital Foundation, and uh, we are happy to uh, support initiatives like the one we start today, Mobile Talks. 
uh, our collaboration with the foundations is an example of uh, the public-private uh, collaboration between both sectors. It's an example of something which is always important, but the more so nowadays. Um, our collaboration also impinges upon the tasks of the foundation, which is to promote the digitalization of our societies, uh, households, uh, companies, and the, overall, the public administration also. They all need the support of foundations like uh, the Mobile World Capital Foundation. It's doing an excellent job at, at this. Uh, our strong partnership is reflected in today's event, uh, the mobile talks that we inaugurate today. It provides us an opportunity to hear very qualified views on the radical transformation that we are observing of the of the of the life of work and how we work and of consumption, which have the the two topics that have been uh, chosen for today. The pandemic has created a huge shock to the global economy. When the pandemic will be over, we, we expect to have a rebound of macroeconomic activity. But in the meantime, uh, what has happened is that we all have been forced to change the way we work, the way we consume. And that's the topic of today, whether these changes are going to become permanent changes or are only temporary. We at CaixaBank have witnessed uh, through our online channels, uh, the huge increase in e-commerce, particularly in the spring of last year, it was increasing at three digit rates. And we have also going, like many other large companies, very quickly onto teleworking and helping our clients from our homes and making sure that uh, all financial services were being provided to them. Uh, at Casa Bank, for many years, we have been developing what we call an omni-channel strategy of providing physical and digital services to our clients and mobile services. We were ready for the, we were ready for the pandemic, but there's always things that you can learn. And what we've done uh, over the last um, year has been to strengthen the ease of use of our online capabilities to make sure that there is full continuity in the service that we provide to our clients in the different ways, the different channels. Sorry, there is something in my uh, screen. Uh, one of these things that happens when you are live. Um, I'm sorry about this. Well, I, I will continue despite the fact that uh, I will call for help, but I will continue, and I'm sorry about this. Now, um, the the population has has gained experience uh, as we have progressed in the during the pandemic, uh, so that with the with the new bouts of infections, there's a problem with the screen, please. The, the with the new bouts of infections. We will have we, what we have seen is that the degree of impact in the evolution of the economy has diminished, and this is good news. Now, the question for today's panel is whether the changes that we've seen are going to be permanent or not, and and uh, that means that uh, we face risks and opportunities. But uh, I would like to hear from you. I'm looking forward to the talk of Mr. Pesarides whether the, the risks outweigh the opportunities or whether the opportunities are more important. Uh, there are pros and cons of working at home. Uh, you can improve your work-life balance. Uh, there are studies that tell you that there is productivity. But on the other hand, we see that uh, working with colleagues and having a collegial atmosphere, a physical atmosphere, uh, promotes the generation of new ideas. And even the Silicon Valley companies uh, did not go before the pandemic to teleworking, and they could have done it, but instead of that, they, they combined both alternatives. Now, uh, in order to discuss these, and I'm sure very other interesting issues, uh, we have the honor to have with us Sir Christopher Pisorides, uh, Professor Christopher Pisorides. He is a leading economist, uh, he is uh, a professor at the London School of Economics. This is his alma mater. This is where he earned his PhD. 
and uh, he's also a professor at the University of Cyprus. Um, he has been, now I see you again, for a while I was not seeing the screen, so I hope you, you were able to see me. Um, he uh, has a distinguished career in macroeconomics and in particular in labor economics and in economic growth. But in particular, he's an expert in the labor market. And his uh, Nobel Prize uh, was awarded on this account together with Professor Diamond and Professor Mortensen and with work which had to do with the job search process and the frictions that are uh, involved in the searching of jobs. And I certainly look forward to hearing from you, Professor Pesarides, whether the, the huge digitalization that we are observing is diminishing that friction and therefore improving the matches in the job market and improving the overall productivity of the economy. Professor Pizarides is a member of uh, very distinguished learned societies of economic thinking, like the Econometric Society, uh, the Center for Economic Policy Research, the British Academy, the European Economic Association, where he was chairman a few years ago, and has been a consultant for the leading international organizations. Thanks very much for being with us. Uh, we all look forward to listening to you and learning from your rich insights. The floor is yours. I'm sorry for the glitches, for the technical problems that that we had a few minutes ago. I hope they were not a major inconvenience. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Mr. Guau, for that uh, very uh, generous introduction. In fact, just to uh, put your mind that um, is, we didn't see any glitches at all when you were speaking. In fact, we, I, at least I was wondering what, you, what the glitches were because I could just see you okay. without any interruption and uh, hearing you very well. It was very, very interesting uh, remarks. I'm always very uh, pleased to talk to um, people in Spain. I'm, uh, you can probably tell from my name, from my affiliation, that I'm of um, Greek origin. I have some special um, connection, if you like, and special sympathies with the problems of the South, you know, Spain, uh, Portugal, Italy, uh, Greece. We all have um, the same problems recently. My main activity, in fact, has been uh, uh, drafting a reform and development program for uh, Greece for the new uh, government of Mr. Mitsotakis that um, was used uh, at least partially as a basis for uh, uh, suggesting programs to the European uh, Union as part of the uh, funds that they're make, uh, making available uh, for the pandemic. Um, the, the pandemic, I mean, one of the many like interesting things or new things that we've seen with the pandemic is that uh, so many professions, uh, certainly the medical profession and the, the economics uh, profession, of course, have, have directed their research so much on what the pandemic means for their um, uh, domains, if you like, you know, like the economies, for what does it mean for the economies, the medical profession, what does it mean for uh, uh, for for, uh, for uh, uh, pandemics and so on, that it's uh, quite remarkable. I hear a scientist speaking, and and they said there's probably hasn't been another event like that that so suddenly and in such big numbers re redirected research in the direction of um, uh, the impact that, that this uh, event is having uh, on, um, on on our economies and uh, and our societies. And um, sometimes, to the extent that sometimes it's difficult to um, realize that it's only been with us for a year, hardly. In fact, I was hearing only in the news last night here that it was a year ago, exactly a year ago, yesterday, that the first patient was admitted to a London hospital uh, with this uh, new virus that we were not even sure exactly what it was. Within two months, we had a, uh, within a, less than two months, in fact, we had our first uh, lockdown. Now, what we need to realize is that um, changes were taking place in the economy before as well, of course, you know, the changes are taking place in the economy all the time. And um, the um, few years before the pandemic, say 10 years or so, we were years where we experienced some of the biggest changes that uh, we've seen in an economy. Some, you know, the World Economic Forum, for example, that characterized them as the fourth industrial revolution, others were calling it the automation, digitalization, and so on. 
the, the essence of them was that new technologies were being introduced in the labor markets and in the way we do trade that were having a huge impact, much bigger impact in the way we do things than uh, changes that had taken place over the, the previous, I don't know, you know, half century, uh, maybe. Um, and then the pandemic arrives and the question is, um, is it changing those um, uh, underlying uh, transformations that were taking place in, in our economies? Or is it uh, slowing them down? Is it accelerating them? And what is it doing? Now, to answer that question, we have to go back and um, ask why were the uh, changes associated with the fourth industrial revolution taking place? And um, what was their, their main impact? And um, as uh, Sun Wun Talan very uh, correctly pointed out uh, in, in our previous, so it was a private conversation, but <laughs> let me just repeat what she pointed out, that uh, the approach that we were following before was that we were looking at tasks that people do at work, and we were asking whether machines can do those tasks better than, than we, than we, we we're doing it as human beings. You know, for example, is it a task that, that depends simply on uh, data processing? Is it one that is repetitive and it could be done by machine? Is it one that is uh, simply follows a certain alg algorithms that, that we could program uh, and, uh, and, and do it? You know, is it something like uh, filing that we can use digital filing instead of great big filing cabinets with papers being open? And if the answer is yes, then we'd say, well, this task will soon be taken over by your machines and the people doing those jobs will lose their jobs and they need to find something else. And then we are asking what jobs cannot be done by uh, human, by, by machines. And the obvious answer is ones that involve direct human interaction uh, and ones that, what, that they are one off events and uh, cannot be programmed on the basis of uh, big data sets, you know, mental illness, for example, is a very obvious one. That will always be those kind of tasks will always be in human hands. All right, so the, the feature that we were looking before the pandemic and we we're saying this is going to be taken over by machines, this is going to remain, you know, when we we're looking at the structural transformation, it was mainly uh, computability and reliability on data. Now, what does the pandemic do? It introduces one more important feature in the characteristic of jobs, and that's, and that's human proximity. It's now telling us that human proximity is not good for you. It, it might make you very sick. And therefore, you have to uh, now consider the, this feature of a job. You know, when you are telling me that uh, a job that involves social interaction will be done by human beings because robots and other machines are not good at it. It, it does involve human proximity. Is it good for you to go and interact with someone else in doing that? And the answer is obviously no under the pandemic, at least not until we are all uh, vaccinated and with effective vaccination. And, and therefore, changes now are taking place in the economy that are driven by, the new, by this new feature. And being a completely new feature, we would expect it to have some permanent changes on the economy, not just more of the same. The obvious question is when, at long last, we're able to get close to each other again, which of course as human beings, especially as Southern Europeans, we love to get close to each other and greet each other with two or three kisses on the, on, on, on the cheeks when we meet. That's a no-no for at least a year now, has been. Um, but when we manage to get uh, back to human proximity, uh, are we going to reverse what happened at work? And I think there are things that will not be reversed. So let me now tell you what I, I think are the three main changes that are taking place because of this human proximity uh, factor. The first one is, uh, is an acceleration of automation. Automation was taking place before uh, businesses we are doing it at a manageable pace, but automation has this feature that it, it, it keeps people away. You know, machines are doing the, the job now. You know, if I had a, a PA, which I never, doing my filing, which I never had by the way, but it's a hypothetical example, that was always next to me in my office and, and we were interacting. Now, if I can do it over my laptop or in a machine, 
it, uh, there is less human interaction. So uh, human uh, acceleration, uh, automation has been accelerating, either accelerating during the pandemic or at least business leaders are saying it will accelerate uh, after the pandemic. What does it mean? Well, it means that many companies are replacing labor with capital internally or intend to replace immediately after the pandemic and they're using more contract work. Contract work is what is um, known as gig work. It's independent suppliers are used for uh, to do work externally outside the firm rather than doing it inside and therefore we have the growth of gig work. Second, at the uh, Retails in the retail sector, especially e-commerce, is taking over because rather than going to a shop where you interact with the shop assistants, human proximity is telling you you want to reduce human proximity. Therefore, you order online, and that is leading to different consumption arrangements. For example, instead of uh, retail shops, now we use warehouses much more. There's more reliance on transportation. There are people driving up and down the streets uh, delivering these uh, packets. Uh, more people are employed in delivery, and those are gig workers as well. What's more is that we are now doing it in isolation, just as I'm talking to you here. When we finish all this, we might switch off, and I might quickly decide, oh, no, I need something uh, that I haven't bought yet. Buy it there. I'm not going to put my coat on and go outside and take a walk in the fresh air to buy it or ask a friend, come with me. Okay, that's number one, more acceleration. Number two, remote work, homework. Many companies have realized that they can work uh, from home or many, they can ask their workers to stay at home and do their work. Universities, of course, are the best example. We do our lecturing uh, from home, online. Uh, look at the meeting we are having now. Uh, remote work has grown a lot because it reduces human proximity again. And we develop new technologies and habits that make uh, work from home uh, productive. It's called the Zoom effect. I realize we're not using Zoom today, but I think Zoom is becoming like a name for the entire sector now of, uh, of, of remote communication rather than just uh, a, a brand name. Finally, there is less travel. There's decline in the hospitality industry, which got a huge negative shock, and business uh, meetings have um, declined. Almost disappeared, in fact physical business meetings, they've all moved online. Again, a kind of Zoom effect. Now, all these three, automation, remote work, travel, uh, will be affected in the longer term. Longer term, I mean, you know, say by 2030, 10 years from now, minus one month. Um, there will be longer term consequences in all these dimensions. Automation will not be reversed. Once we invent the machines and we put them in place, we're not going to throw them away. Online shopping will decline a, a little, but we're not going to return to the high street and personal shopping at the levels that we had in the past. Uh, we will continue to use online shopping because of the, rather, you know, we're going to throw away the advantages of the shop, social interaction and the fresh air because of the convenience of online hopping. Homework will, will decline from today's levels, obviously. Many of us are going to go back. University professors, I hope, will go back and uh, lecture in person. Uh, but much more uh, will remain. Uh, there are estimates already coming out of uh, surveys of businesses, the United, mainly the United States, but also Britain, in fact, I've seen. And they're saying that about 20% of work will now be done uh, from your home. That's about one day a week on average, but of course it will not be distributed uh, completely equally. And finally, although I think that personal travel for tourism will recover, maybe in a different nature, as um, you will see one of the clips on, on, on tourism, but in terms of um, money spent and quantity will soon recover, business travel will not recover, I think. We're going to continue having virtual meetings, or at least businesses will. Now, uh, why would we change after a pandemic? You know, say the pandemic would last a year. I think we lost your voice. Hello, Professor. I think we lost your voice. Maybe you muted your computer um, uh, accidentally. No, I didn't. Oh, uh, we can hear you now. You can hear it? Okay, no, it must have been a temporary lapse. Okay, 
my, the question I was asking my, <laughs> myself, why would we change our ways of uh, doing business or, or living, if you like, uh, after a pandemic, if it will be short-lived, if the pandemic is going to be last only 18 months, why would it affect the next 10 years? The, the answer is apparently because the, the pandemic has forced us to develop new technologies that will continue to be useful after it. We will not throw them away, these new uh, uh, discoveries. I mean, just think of online shopping. They, I, I, I don't want to advertise any particular company, but at, at least in Britain, it's becoming synonymous with, um, with a company whose name is beginning with A. And um, it's become so convenient they develop such a technology that, uh, you know, it's a platform more than anything, that it's hard to see people saying, oh, no, I'm, not going, I'm never going to use that again. I'm just going to walk. Uh, to the, or or take the uh, uh, tube, the underground uh, to to central London to shop from now. It, it will remain. The technology is there. Uh, think think of business meetings. Zoom is so convenient, uh, and and the other kind of software that we have. You would say someone, you know, why bother to meet for lunch to discuss this or whatever? Let's have a quick one on, on online. It, it's a technology point. The other reason that I believe is that is that once we're given the chance to have it to try something out uh, as a new way of doing things uh, like home working, then we continue using it. The, the, the idea there is, is connected to two uh, kind of ideas in economics that have been discussed for a very long time. One of them is is uh, is what's known as a as a coordination uh, failure in that there are many activities you, where you need a critical mass of people to be doing it if you are going to do it as well. But there is nothing to give you the motivation in normal times for that critical mass of people to do it. You know, like if, if we're all working in an office and suddenly one of us says, I'm going to work from home one day a week, your employer is going to look, look at you in a strange way and say, what for? So we're going to do all kinds of arrangements, especially for you to work at home. That's very suspicious. No, they would say. But if if a big event, if a shock like the pandemic comes and forces all of us to work from home, or at least the vast majority of us to work from home, then afterwards you can say, well, you see it now, we have the technology, we know how it works, so we're going to continue it. The other economic theory, in fact, is one that got the Nobel Prize last year, I think, or maybe a year before, in 2018, is, is what's known as the nudge theory. It's kind of behavioral economics, that, that if you're happy with what you're doing and you carry on doing it, you you don't usually try something else that will change you completely from doing it. You know, I mean, let that if you're happy, just let it carry on. But if you are forced to do it, someone is giving you a push and you do it, you realize that perhaps it's better and more efficient. So you would expect this um, kind of remote work, for example, to, to to actually increase the efficiency and at least the happiness of employees and therefore the efficiency of the company in a kind of stakeholder. Uh, the nature objectives of companies which are becoming more and more popular now with sustainability environmental issues as well as uh, happiness of um, of employees and customers okay my final uh, comments have probably spoken more than I was intended uh, intending um, various issues come up uh, here and I have three actually here that maybe will be taken up in later discussions so I just uh, list them the first one is that with remote work, there's going to be less clear-cut distinction between commercial and residential areas in cities. So we need to rethink the design of cities, if you like. Some services will need to transfer from commercial to residential areas. How will it affect life? You know, if I walk uh, from my office at the LSE outside, within five minutes walk, I will probably find six or seven uh, cafes and um, out of those six or seven, five of them would probably be Starbucks selling the same coffee that doesn't taste quite as good as the Southern European coffee. But many people like them. But there are one or two Italian ones here and there as well. Uh, if I walk out of my house and walk for five minutes, I assure you I won't meet a single uh, coffee bar. This will have to change. You know, it's nice to have parks here, but it would be nice if there was a nice place selling uh, nice coffee in the park as well. Uh, now, second, we have new consumption patterns. There is more consumption at home, there is ca less casual socializing, less informal networking in business meetings. Again, take this meeting that we're having now. If we didn't have the pandemic, I would probably come to Barcelona. I love the city. 
see a bit of Gaudi, uh, one or two of you socialize, talk, go to a nice restaurant, drink a nice wine, come back with nice memories and, and made new friends. Now I made remotely new friends, of course, still very welcome, but not quite the same as uh, in, in person. A, a, a lot of shopping, in fact, involves socializing, you know, let's go out and and, and have a coffee and I also need to buy something, let's go, you know, to the high street, that kind of, uh, of, of kind of activity. And finally, gig work is unregulated, it does not offer good career jobs, it needs to be regulated. I just heard, in fact, that you had a, a big change, a big agreement in uh, Spain where um, it might affect the future of that. It would be very good if you had it. The, over here, they keep talking about it. They're not doing anything about it in the United States. Of course, they wouldn't even think about talking about it. Uh, you know, just to give you examples, they, the gig workers, they have no sick leave, no annual paid leave for vacation, no pensions. The individual does not have control over the hours of work and things like that. Now, the question is, if you are going to do it, is who is going to provide them? That's a big, big question. Governments need to take more initiatives here to ensure that good gig work is a good work. Companies alone cannot do it, and I don't blame them because gig workers are independent workers. Thank you very much. I'm going to stop here, and I uh, would be more than happy to... Uh, yeah, I will ask you not to stop here. Let me ask you some questions because you, you went through very yeah. interesting things. And I would like to... First, um, I want to ask you for something. As we are with certain distance, we first provide you some sun that I know in London there was not sun on the last day, so we it's a little bit remaining. <laughs> yeah, this, this is a present from Barcelona. But the second thing, the next time you come to Barcelona, we want to have that lunch with you. Um, but now, let me... I'm going to take you up on that. Don't think I'm going to forget it. <laughs> no, 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 we'll be happy to do it. But let me ask you some things. You talked um, about very interesting things, about this pandemic, which is an accelerator of some things that were being cooked on the past. You talk about this um, as the biggest revolution in the economy in terms of the digitalization. Um, I don't want to go very long on, on these questions because we've got an amazing panel afterwards, but I want to ask you five, six things. First, and I would like to ask you um, very short questions or uh, quick questions with quick answers um, to see if you can tell me um, some idea on this. Um, after this, um, what we're living now, do you think businesses will be more effective? will learn to be more effective, efficient, let's say? I, I, I think so, or at least I, I, I hope so. You see, after, we, after the pandemic, the, the situation will be different, the market situation around. There will be business with new technologies, they will be, they've been pushing more now, they will come out with more, and, and they have to be more effective to, uh, to, to survive. Uh, they have to take into account the, uh, the health within the organization, um, the interests of their employees and their customers much more as people rather than uh, just as, uh, as, as units that receive boxes and, and, and then they go away. So they have to be more effective on, on that aspect, on providing a better service. If I, if, if I ask you, um, and uh, let's say, recommendation in one word or in a couple of adjectives. What would you tell to chairmen, we'll speak with some of them afterwards, but to any chairman of a company that it's key to pay attention to on the next seasons? I think it's key to um, pay attention more to the, um, in, to the interests of the employees. I mean, I'm not saying they were not doing it uh, before, of course, but <laughs> don't get me wrong, I wouldn't know anyway. <laughs> But rather than, um, be, you know, how, I mean, how can I put it not to imply that? No, let, let, let me look at it more in the abstract. You said to me we're going to have business leaders and what would I tell them? More, more in the abstract. I, I, I think companies will be moving in the direction of the uh, stakeholder um, uh, approach to uh, running a business than before. It, it, because they are going to, they, they will need to include uh, health within the organization, um, uh, socialize more, more kind of social, pay more attention to the social interaction, the space they are providing, and um, the um, the way that um, 
if, if you go back 20 years in the 1990s or something, then the biggest influence on company behavior, especially in the United States coming out of there, is what used to be known as the Friedman, the Milton Friedman doctrine, which is that if you want to make the most uh, social good, then just try to maximize your rate of return to your shareholders. I, I, I think that is almost dead, but is still breathing somehow. I think it's going to die completely. Hmm. Pay more attention to your employees, pay more attention to the environment, to sustainability, because we become much more aware of that. Um, generally more attention to the community in which you are operating. Your shareholders are one aspect of what you should be looking at. Obviously here you don't want to, uh, if you're going to lose the money, they're not going to invest in you, so you need to give them some rate of return. But at the same time, make sure that they know that you're, that you're contributing a lot to your community, you're you are taking care of your customers. If you're in the food industry, for example, you're providing them with very healthy products, with very good labeling and uh, what's in there, what how to use it and all that. And, and you are looking after your employees mm -hmm. as people that have an interest in the company as well, and you have an interest in their well-being. Okay, and, and let me let me face now some uh, more uh, macroeconomical uh, economical concepts. You uh, are very well known for your whole career, but everybody talks also about your theory about job creation, job destruction. Uh, <coughs> what we heard um, recently from international labor organizations is that uh, we had employment losses in 2020 of the estimated 114 million jobs relative to 2019. My question is, is this only the beginning? I mean, is now, are we gonna face now the, 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 the other curve that maybe we should flatten, which is this amount of um, losers, uh, job losers? Yeah, yeah, we're we're going to we're going to face a lot more job losses than we were expecting before, uh, to a large extent because of the um, automation that is accelerating. The the most um, reliable estimates from uh, automation, you know, automation is what gives you most of the job destruction. There is a lot of job uh, turnover within uh, sectors and within occupations, but automation is one where. It, it, it's the one that is more painful. It's the one that, is, that involves more frictions, if you like, if I use the terminology that we mm -hmm. uh, used in our work. And it is that the, the, the job is lost because it's taken over by machine and there isn't a similar job in the same sector to take. You have to change sector of the economy. The most reliable estimates over the next uh, 10 years up to about 2030 that um, were in the literature you know, from the OECD and various other people was about 15% of jobs would be lost to machines and and those workers would need to re relocate somewhere else involving yeah. training, learning new skills. Now with the pandemic, of course, the current situation is not typical. You know, there, there are jobs being lost in hospitality, for example, that will come back because when we can travel again, we're going to do it for tourism or we can go, we're going to go to restaurants again. Um, when um, we go back to what might be look like post-COVID normal times, there will be another five to 10% job destruction uh, more um, because of uh, changes that are taking place in, the, in businesses, partly automation, partly the, uh, the, the, the remote work and so on. And those workers will have to uh, relocate as well. So instead of the 15% that we were talking before, we now have to talk about 20% or even a, a little bit more than 20% as the job destruction. The job creation will have to be come from somewhere. And unfortunately, the sectors that involve most uh, human interaction that were creating the large number of jobs, especially in hospitality, will not become very active very soon. The health sector, of course, health and care will become very active. But there is hospitality, there is real estate management, the household services, personal services, those will be very slow to grow up again. So the situation the macroeconomic situation, at least on the job creation, job destruction side, doesn't, it, it doesn't look very encouraging. No job destruction, less job creation. It looks, Professor, that I will really need that lunch because I had prepared so many questions to ask you and, and uh, it's going to be impossible because we've got an amazing um, panel afterwards. But let me do one more Because question. I talk too much when you ask me questions. No, 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 no. <laughs> it's, it's, it's because it's so interesting. Um, the, the question I wanted to ask you uh, in that sense is, I was saying that in economic terms, it would be amazing to flatten that curve. but 
the question, and I will make like two or three in one, uh, so we'll try to make it shorter. How can we overcome this, um, this situation, this period? Is there any magic, um, let's say, recipe or solution? And uh, I ask you that because I know you're um, closely working with the Greek government. Uh, they even called uh, your solutions the Pisarides report. And I would like to know which are those recipes to help a country for an economic uh, recovery, in short, because we don't have, I mean, I'm sure there is a lot of work behind, but just some tips that uh, well, you can provide well, us and we'll the, go with the, the panel. The, 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 the main one actually is education and training. I mean, education, 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 as uh, Tony Blair used to say, and um, and training at work, which might even be more important. Training done uh, within companies, uh, the workers will have to own the, the training, but of course, government has to support it because of um, poaching risks and all that. So, if, so if you want a very short uh, answer, is don't try to stop this transition of workers. The better trained they are, and the better education you give them the more likely it is that jobs will be created to take them on. And that training will have to involve both technical skills and social skills, I'm afraid, because sooner or later we're going to become social animals again. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, Professor. As I was saying, it's, it's uh, I mean, listening, listening to you is utterly enriching, but I would also like to introduce to uh, some other guests that wanted to join us for uh, a little while. Uh, I think we will at least go a bit further, six, uh, so that we can uh, we can just um, explore a bit more about this topic. But as you uh, all may know, since we are trying to analyze this topic, as I was saying at the beginning, in a much more profound way, we wanted to evaluate the future of consumption from several perspectives. Some of them you mentioned, Professor, future professions, the future of local commerce, psychological and sociological um, effects, also, of course, about the effects in, in travel, culture, leisure, and tourism. Uh, those are some very important things, and that's why we invited these few uh, relevant professionals who are linked mm -hmm. to some of these topics. So I would, start to, I would like to start talking or presenting Sangul Tolan uh, as a researcher, part of the team leading the, pro the project Humanite uh, from the European Commission. She works also for the German Institute for Economic Research in Berlin, and she conducted research in the field of education and pension economics with focus on the analysis of employment and fiscal effects of partial retirement policies. Sangul, how are you doing? Thank you very much for joining us. Hello, thank you very much for the invitation. It's great to have you with us. I, I want to introduce also Ignacio Garcia Magarzo, uh, General Director of Acedas, the Spanish Association of Retailers and Supermarkets. Uh, Ignacio, hello, how are you doing? Thank you very much for joining us. Hello, good afternoon to everyone from Madrid. It's a pleasure to be with you. It's, it's an honor. Um, Jacques Weber, uh, General Director at Nestle Spain. Hello, and thank you very much for joining us also. Hello, Jacques. Hello, hello, good afternoon. A real pleasure to be with a such a distinguished table and starting with a very inspiring uh, message from uh, Dr. Pizarides. You are making it distinguished, uh, Jack. Thank you very much. Um, and also Sasha Michaud, CEO and co-founder of Global. Thank you very much also for joining us today, uh, Sasha. No, um, thank you. Thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to, as I was saying, uh, we will have to go a bit further, six, maybe 10, 15 minutes, because we want to listen to you. And um, uh, we, will, we will call you when we have that lunch with Professor Pisarides so that you can join us because we want to ask him many things. But um, before we go on that, I would like to ask you, um, the same way we heard to Professor, if I know um, it's not going to be fair enough, but I would like to hear your point your reflections, your thoughts on, on, on what we were debating. You can highlight your own, um, your own sector. You can, of course, zoom in your own sector. But I would like to go one by one with you, just with some quick ideas in one minute, Sangul. If you want to start, uh, I would like to know what you think about it, whenever you want, Sangul. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, these are, um, yeah, you can hear me. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, these are truly good times to discuss the future of work. And Mr. Pissaridis has already mentioned quite a few uh, of the changes that we are going to face. Uh, some of them are going to be driven by the digital transformation and some of them are also going to be driven by artificial intelligence. And we've seen videos of artificial intelligence um, achieving superhuman capabilities and these might have given us a glimpse on what our future of work may look like. And if anything, and this is what Mr. Pesaridis has mentioned too, the COVID-19 pandemic is going to accelerate this process 
clearly the pandemic has given a boost to digital transformation and we have also seen a big shift of consumption to into the digital sphere and um, an incre increase in the use of online platforms and our dependency on them. So these technological innovations, they are going to make us more efficient. They are going to make us more productive and they are going to make us wealthier. There's a lot of good that we can expect from technological innovations, but there are also many challenges that we have to face. For instance, many people are worried that they are going to lose their jobs. So we must see that we create new and hopefully better jobs. Many people are concerned that we may not be ready to fulfill the changing skill requirements. So we must have a plan about the new skills that are required and invest in these skills. There's a concern that the new wealth that we will obtain from AI is not going to be equally distributed. So there will just be a few winners that will get a piece of the cake and a majority only gets to observe the beauty of this new cake. And we must have responses ready for this too. So many workers uh, in so-called new forms of work are dealing with the negative impacts on their working conditions. Mr. Pasaridis has mentioned that too. And uh, finally, some might fear that the implementation of artificial intelligence, for example, will increase the discrimination of marginalized groups and that this is hidden under the perceived neutrality of algorithms and statistics. We must have mechanisms that detect and prevent these problems to ensure that artificial intelligence that we use is trustworthy. And overall, many people are concerned that these increases in efficiency and productivity and wealth, they come at the cost of human well-being. So we must make sure that these innovations are steered in a direction that is human-centered and that respects human dignity. Thank you very much, Sengul. I think, I think we'll ha we, we should need another panel to, to basically debate if, as you said, this is going to be really human-centric in terms of if humans are only part of it for the platforms to be enriching their um, their own uh, kind of wealthy, or if they are the, the final objective to, to get a better world for humans. Uh, anyway, we'll debate about that. Thank you very much. Ignacio Arcia Manarza, as we were saying, General Director of ACEDAS, the Association of Retailers and Supermarkets. Um, can you just share uh, your take in one minute, please? Yes, thank you very much, people. Thank you for your invitation. Thank you, Professor Pichalides, for your inspiring uh, presentation. Well, and also thank you for being so provo provocative and so challenging in your introduction video, because um, uh, there was a, 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 a question, which is, will uh, supermarkets will disappear? Well, I represent supermarkets, so I must say uh, no. So I, I, I feel I, like I'm, I'm here to, to preserve my job and my companies. <laughs> uh, well, of, of course, uh, I, as you know, I represent uh, Spanish supermarkets. Uh, which are um, both regional and national and international uh, companies. Uh, they have uh, more than 207,000 uh, uh, jobs and, and uh, 20,000 shops, uh, bricks and mortar, uh, mortar mostly. But uh, most of them are going digital from, from the last 10 years and also sell online. So um, the thing is, um, why uh, food retail online is getting a little bit slower to the consumer than other services or, or non-food retail. Is it in Spain, for example, because um, our clients, our consumers are, are less digital? The answer is no, because they buy online many of the things. Uh, are companies less prepared to be digital? The answer should be no also, because they are working really hard to, to meet consumer needs in, uh, also in the website. Of course, pandemia has uh, been a, 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 an accelerating driven to, to create a new necessity to attend um, uh, new uh, consumers uh, that have uh, less mobility. And uh, on the other hand, we see that uh, proximity, shops nearby our homes or jobs, has been essential for authorities to create the, the, the conditions to fight the pandemic. We, we were there uh, providing food supply to all the population, so this is why we uh, can adapt to these restrictions to mobility to fight the pandemic. So it's a, it's a very, very interesting and very exciting moment. I, I would like to develop uh, later on on, on some uh, issues about uh, consumer behavior, but, uh, but this is uh, why we see it. we are in, in, the, in, the, 
in the best moment to to uh, analyze the situation, especially in food retail. Yeah, we'll, we will analyze that. Thank you very much. Yeah, the question was a bit provocative, but we wanted to know your opinion and we wanted to know if you were planning to move to uh, some other sector in case uh, you were going to say yes. So yeah, yeah, we'll debate about that. Um, Jack Zuber, uh, General Manager, General Director at Nestle Spain, um, Spain now, because you've been General Manager at Nestle in Philippines, in Japan, in uh, Rumania, you've been working in so many places. So. Um, What's your take on this? Uh, because you were affected on both sides. I mean, you've been the effects of the pandemic in the hospitality sector, as Ignacio was pointing it, but also in, in the, um, sorry, in the supermarket, but also in the hospitality, so in bars, restaurants. Um, what's your take in one minute, please? Uh, yes, as, as you said, we have been impacted on both side, retail and out of home. I would say we have been impacted on three sides. It's out of home, retail, but also on our own organization with our own people. And I think that we see also two faces. When we had the beginning of the pandemic, we had it very clear that the first thing you have to do is to protect your people. It's to make an environment that it is safe. It, is, it was a challenge to, to have all our factories safe for all our, uh, our people. We had to move to uh, 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 working from home from one day to another, 2,000 people. We are not really prepared for that. The good news is that I think we have been much more agile than we thought we we, we were. Uh, and then we have been affected, of, of course, in our business. Uh, food is essential in life of uh, every uh, people. When you have a crisis, obviously, it becomes extremely emotional. And we have seen crazy buying at the beginning of, uh, of March, and then it went down. We see the online Uh, channel growing extremely fast and it will continue to grow, not at the same pace, because I think we have unlocked the potential of this uh, uh, channel. We have seen that the out of form a dramatic uh, uh, decrease, a very affected uh, sector. We do believe that it will recover differently, like everyone, we will have to, to adapt. And, and then uh, retail, obviously, I think what is worth to mention is that it has been fantastic, the solidarity between suppliers and retailers on how we can uh, supply the, the food to the community. I think there is an, uh, another element I'm repeating with a, eventually a different perspective. I think all the changes that we are seeing were existed before. People want a food that it is healthier. Sustainability is absolutely critical now for all uh, for all uh, consumer. And I think that this has acceler accelerated. It was less visible because the health aspect was more important. But sustainability, it's key. It's it's key. I think it is a, a license to operate. So. Uh, huge investment that we have to do there. And of course, uh, in our organization, our culture, it's not the same way to work uh, all together in one office and then now to work out of uh, the office. Many people does not want to come back to the office. Others are really waiting the first day to come back uh, to, the, to the office. We will have to, to find a new culture, a new way to, to, we have to find how to evolve. And this you can only do with our own people. And, and I think that thanks to the situation, and it's a bit uh, counterintuitive, but we have been talking much more to our people. We have been closer to our people. And, and I think this is absolutely key for the, for the future. Our business model also has to evolve, obviously, with all those changes. We used to focus on having absolutely the best uh, product. Now we need to really talk about the best service, the best experience. And I'm, I'm super happy to have Sasha with us. And, and I, I don't think it's because of the pandemic, but it has accelerated. Now we work uh, in that uh, channel, the meal delivery uh, at home. For us, it is an opportunity. It is a, it is a challenge. At the end, I think that, was a, that it is a tremendous challenge, but also a fantastic opportunity to evolve and most probably to evolve to also to much closer to our own uh, values of social responsibility and uh, uh, sustainability on how we can have a, an impact in that. Yeah, and I'm, I'm aware that um, from your company and, and uh, while you're leading it, uh, and in May you made some important changes uh, To, to, to work with the team, to work uh, towards sustainability and uh, all, all that amount of things. So thank you very much. We, we'll face 
some of the things you said, and you mentioned Sasha Michaud, CEO and co-founder of Global. Uh, while you were talking, actually, we saw some rider um, in some images that we, we were just living. And uh, I was thinking on, on Sasha because this pandemic also affect uh, Global and other companies like yours uh, in, a, in a very strong way. Um, you were, and some part of your team, of your writers, were, um, well, uh, people who, in a way, made it easier also for the people. Like Ignacio was saying, um, many people in the supermarkets were there uh, in the front row, and also the writers were there on the front row. I remember a cover of, uh, I think, Time Magazine with everything closed, confined, locked down, but a writer. Um, how did you feel it? I mean, can you just go ahead with one minute and, on, from your point of view? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, obviously, um, you know, delivery services generally worldwide were considered essential service uh, during, you know, during this crisis that we're still living, actually. So, so it's important. I just wanted to do my intro and I'll try and be brief because we're, I know we're running late is, you know, on Professor Sarius touched on a couple of points and I think they're really key. Um, I think the first is acceleration. Um, I think, you know, things were happening in, in certain segments before the pandemic, but what's happened with the pandemic, they've accelerated. Um, E-commerce is one, you know, um, many consumers were used to buying products in their city, either locally or a little bit more, they're willing to travel for those. And they, during the pandemic, they became accustomed in the habit of, of actually ordering online. It becomes, wow, this is actually useful. I can actually order anything online. So they, this is something that, that won't go away. It's accelerated. And then what specific, specific affects us is, is a concept we are calling Q-commerce, which is quick commerce. Um, and that's, you know, the movement from e-commerce, which is probably next day and 48 hours to actually write immediately within, within under an hour. And we've seen the acceleration of that. Until today, it's been food, precisely restaurant food, but this has changed into, into groceries, into retailers as they move in. The second thing that we know as acceleration is, is, is digitalization of retail businesses. I think it's fair to say that digital, digitalization of retail is probably the last slot on, on this world of digitalization. Um, and we're talking about SMEs specifically, small you know, establishments with one, two, two, two stores. And they're in a position now suddenly to compete against e-commerce because they can they can deliver immediately, right? They're, the, they're very close to the consumer. And we see a tendency of they will do a mixed model in the future where they can actually serve customers in their stores, but actually deliver stuff literally within 20, 30 minutes, which is something the e-commerce can't compete. So there's an opportunity there. And then how does this affect the future of work, um, which is the other point that I think Professor was, I mean, quite rightly, I mean, we have we have some homework to do here and, and, and actually more than homework, we have something to do. Um, we're involved in, in something called the gig economy, which, which obviously affects a lot of other things, and it has massive benefits, but also negative impact to the workers. Um, and what we can't do is ignore its existence and pretend, you know, that it's, it's not the future. Um, it, it's, it's not going to go away. What we need to do is address all the negative aspects and look for solutions. And, and we're talking about social coverage for these workers, sick pay, holiday pay, earnings guarantees, collective voice, all these things that autonomous workers don't have, and look for mechanisms how we can maintain the flexibility, but give them all these additional rights and coverage. And even if it's the companies who pay for them, as they do with labor contracts. So I think that's something that we really need to do and we need to lead the way from the Europe. I think EU is in a unique position where social rights are super important, which they can lead the way on this and, and, and other demographics, the other side of the Atlantic or in Asia can actually follow suit. Thank you very much, Sasha. It sounds very interesting. Let me ask you something. Now that you were pointing out what Professor said, he also mentioned about gig economy and gig workers, and about this um, recent information we learned a couple of hours ago that the Ministry of Labor agrees with employees and trade union that riders will be by default, apparently, they will be full-time employers with a fixed wage, except for when they point out that someone is uh, autonomous or freelance. What do, you, what do you think about that? Well, I think the key is, is maintaining the flexibility. And, and not because the model needs it or not because our, our company needs it. It's because those workers are, are asking for that. You know, they, they're, they're asking for, for freedom. They're asking to, to maybe one day work 10 hours and another 30. Um, they want to combine it with other things and, and asking for that. So what we need to do is, is make sure they have the right social rights. Now, does this have to be a specific labor relationship? Um, I don't believe necessarily so. I believe if the workers are looking for that, it definitely should be. But if they're not, we should look for ways to adapt to what I believe is, is the way work is moving, which is more flexible ways. Um, that, that's, I think that's the, the, the real thing that we need to deal with. And, and again, it goes a little bit what I said earlier. I think in the EU, we, we have a unique way of, of tackling that problem um, from a worker's perspective and, and social rights perspective.
Thank you. Thank you very much, Sasha. Um, just on that side, and let me ask you a couple of things, Professor first, Professor Pisarides. Um, is the gig economy, which is a reality, as, as uh, Sasha was saying, is this gig economy and, gig, um, and the platform economy a solution or a problem? Or I mean, how it, it's going to be here for ever, probably, or for many years. So how do we? Well, have to yeah. I mean, its, it's development started uh, started before as well, and it was growing, and it's because of the acceleration of uh, technology that uh, it's um, it's it's become more prevalent, and it's likely to continue. It, it it's a I mean, you know, you say it's a solution. You might ask, well, what's the problem that it's giving a solution to? You might say, well, it's the new technologies, automation, it's the way companies are being organized. I, I think what Sasha said just before actually is absolutely key. I, I think it's an outcome of, of companies looking for more flexibility. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are workers who are, are prepared to offer that flexibility through gig work, but there are many other things they don't like about it. And uh, what we need to do is to find ways of regulating. I mean, you mentioned the Spanish reform. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I will have to look at the, uh, at the details of the, of the agreement because I'm, I'm puzzled by, um, what it, uh, by the, one, the, the one important element of that. Who, who is going to pay the wage? If it, it is the company that makes them properly salaried employees and pays them, then it's no longer good work. They're just driving as employed with the company. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the thing about gig work is that workers don't work for a single company. They might work for a single company for a short period of time, but you know I've seen a survey of Uber drivers, for example. In the, I, I think it was mainly it was I'm not sure if it was exclusively United States or mainly that something like 60 to 70 percent of them had uh, other jobs, worked for other companies as well. Um, now, why they're doing it? I don't know, they're saying there's more flexibility whenever they go wherever there is work. But obviously, if that's the situation you have, you're going to have in Spain, then all these, uh, right, all these drivers, you call them drivers, you call them riders, riders. I assume, riders. In, riders in, in, in British English, you're know, speaking American English, <laughs> maybe. That's true. Um, they, I mean, I mean, they're not going to, they're not going to agree to be paid by a single company and work only for that company because they immediately lose their flexibility that they have. So I, I don't, I don't know what the outcome of that agreement would be if you would make you, it. You, you painted at something interesting that um, Sasha also explained many times. But I would like to ask to to Saul Teran, as a researcher and someone who who studies how AI impacts labor markets. The question is here. How do we, and of course it could be a question for any of you, but how do we combine innovation and regulation in the right way so that we don't um, kind of silent innovation, we don't stop it, but um, we do it in a good way so that companies like, like uh, Global can now, which are the rules, and so they can go on and, and, and improve and, and, and test, A-B test, and try to see other opportunities. How do you do that? <laughs> Uh, thank you. Yeah, this is a very good question. Um, so what we've seen in the pandemic is that uh, some of the member states have extended their worker protection covers that they had for normal employees also to autonomous workers. So clearly, just like the COVID-19 pandemic was a very good uh, force to reveal or very good revealer to see to to reveal social problems that are there and that we have to look at and then uh, that we have to work on. It was also very good in pointing out or revealing problems that might be prevalent among um, autonomous workers. And specifically, the regulation was considered, and we actually found or we, fo we saw that regulation was also necessary for autonomous workers. Um, and in general, it's, it's always a big it's always difficult to um, to consider the trade-off between uh, over-regulation and dampening innovation. Uh, and under regulation and um, maybe paying with the cost of human dignity hmm. and um, human human rights uh, what uh, what would be a really good regulation or would really help is to try to have regulation in a way that steers innovation to directions that really substantially affect productivity and that have a very good that are not towards innovations that are not just labor replacing, but also labor augmenting. Because if we have um, labor replaced, but um, the labor that is being replaced leads to 
uh, and the technology that is replacing the labor is increasing productivity rapidly. Uh, new jobs, uh, this is going to create price effects and this is going to stimulate demand. And we've seen this in uh, many uh, other sectors before. Demand leads to more op occupations and will lead to more jobs. So uh, if we if we are able to um, define regulations that, that really um, promote um, creative solutions or creative production or product, uh, creative innovation, um, we we can actually have a regulation um, promote better innovation. Thanks. Um, uh, in that sense, um, Jack, I, I was thinking, um, and we, we talked about that yesterday, but uh, there are many challenges for companies like Nestle, like yours, um, for any company in, in the situation or in the sectors that you are in. Uh, we heard today news about Heineken, that they will have to fire part of their team um, because of the loses of uh, income and all that. How are you focusing the challenges in the future, the next month or years? Because the way you reacted as, as a company when the pandemic arrived uh, are amazing. I mean, you didn't have any, uh, any support in terms of economical finance uh, of the administrations. You preserved the full salary for, uh, I think, at least 12 weeks for every single worker in the company. You uh, invested 500 million euro in, in um, hospitality sector. Uh, I mean, you changed everything from one day to the other one. So how are you facing the new challenges and what are you, do what are you going to do? We cannot hear you. Probably you're muted, um, Jack, sorry. Yeah, it's, it's a normal thing. We're uh, getting used sorry. to like, the Zoom effect, yeah. no problem. Yeah. Now, so, uh, yes, for us, uh, as I said at the beginning, we said the first thing was to protect our people, uh, to protect, obviously, from the virus, but it was also to make them comfortable because there is no solution in such a crisis without having the full support of your people. And, and so this is why we, we believed at the beginning to say that if we give them already at starting point an horizon of 12 months to be secured, they will not lose their jobs, they will get their pay, then you start to have a full collaboration with your, your people to find the solution on how we can find our way in this pandemic. So that was a very important uh, element. And it went beyond, actually, because when you see our own people from the sales team, as we said before, we had a very negative impact on one channel, the out of home, and a positive impact on retail. And our, the, our sales people accepted that, OK, we, we're not going to take uh, over bonus in retail, and we're going to share our bonus with the people from the out of home. So everybody was treated equally. And, and it took a few seconds to take that decision with all of them. Why? Because they, they felt that, OK, the company first is taking care of, our, uh, of us and then we can, we, can go, uh, we can go on. That was the same, by the way, with our partners. Uh, uh, the, the, the point of sales, the cafes, the restaurants, the hotel, particularly the, the cafes, uh, uh, we had to show, guys, we are together and we will support you the best way we, we can. So it was not only through giving product, it was also to uh, stop to suspend the rental fees for the coffee machine. They had no customers, they cannot pay for it. And, and with this, I can tell you, you create a real trust, a real loyalty for the, for the future. And, and they are suffering, we are, at, uh, we are with them to, to the extent that, uh, that we can, because we are partners. And, and, and I think this is when there is a crisis that the word partnership takes all its uh, is meaning. And, and the other one was obviously the community. Uh, the community, as you said, we, we supported some hospital, we supported some other people, uh, truck drivers that uh, 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 didn't have the chance to find food. I think this is moment where a big corporation like Nestle has to assume its responsibility, its role, its scale, in the community, and we could not miss this one. We could not, okay. and, and actually, we received the reward from our people to do more, and we will do more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Uh, um, Ignacio, I was thinking about what I asked you before. Uh, we're running a bit out of time, but we'll still have eight or 10 minutes to explore things. But the question, the provocative questions, where supermarkets disappear, uh, <laughs> of course, it was provocative, but we know that we're not that comfortable in crowded spaces. I'm not talking about supermarkets, I'm talking about in general. Um, but at the same time, we've heard that supermarkets are 
uh, a valuable and a very interesting place to to be in on the next time, on the next years. Um, let's say, for example, Aldi chain will keep on expanding with 40 new supermarkets in 2021. Uh, at least in Spain, I talk a little keeps with their expansion. We've seen lots of moves in that sense, so it doesn't look like supermarkets are going to disappear. Um, how do you expect, um, or how do you foresee the next few months or years in terms of supermarkets, hypermarkets? Ah, thank you, people. Uh, less provocative and more precise <laughs> for me to explain. Well, um, uh, let me explain. Obviously, we have been following the, the consumer behavior very closely in the last five, uh, eight years. Um, and uh, of course, um, uh, what, we, what we've seen is an increase of what we call the mixed consumer, uh, who buys both uh, online and offline both online, some products, and also uh, like to, to, to visit uh, shops to get, um, to get a, a good experience and, uh, and also to choose products. So, um, as I said before, the pandemic has been uh, really um, dramatic uh, effect in this these consumer behavior because there's a new consumer that is the one who don't want to be out home and don't want to visit shop because uh, he fears and of safety, uh, limits of mobility imposed by authorities. So we have to, to, to take this very closely into account for the next years. Um, uh, what, what, what will be the future? We, we really go and support for what we call the, the, the digital proximity. I mean, these uh, both uh, multi-channel buyer of, of food and, and some other issues um, uh, that w will uh, want to, to, to buy online some products and will still want to visit shop to buy some others. Um, the problem with online is that, um, as you all know, um, it had to be also sustainable. And uh, as we sell products with a, a, a very low price in general, um, it is not uh, easy to, 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 to make it uh, uh, sustainable in, in, in economic way because, of course, of the cost of, of, uh, of the last mine uh, and the cost of delivery, which is something that Sacha knows really well. So we have to uh, really improve our, our sector to try to make it, uh, uh, to, to, to contain this cost and make it profitable in some countries like European ones, uh, where uh, delivery is not so so easy that in, in, in some other places like, like the United States, for example. But uh, the future food retail consumer on and, off, and offline uh, will also travel in a social way. So this means that it has to cover all the population. Uh, fortunately, in Spain and, and in Europe, there are not uh, what we call food desserts. Uh, it means that uh, you don't have to, you don't have uh, enough uh, offer of food products uh, near your home, or at least 50 minutes from your home, which is uh, something that we all see, uh, which is essential. So we have to combine this uh, logistic uh, approach to the to the new mobility both uh, uh, physical and, and uh, uh, digital. And the last one is, is uh, environment. Uh, um, also, the, the new commerce, uh, food retail commerce, we, we ha will have to be sustainable uh, for the environment and for the planet. And of course, um, logistics in, in food uh, has to be sustainable and to take very closely into account uh, the, the, the problem of, of uh, mobility generating uh, more and more uh, problems in the city centers, for, for example, and also the, the packaging issue with, with the directives and all the, on, and all the circular uh, economy. So we have to make a mix with all these and, and use the pandemic as an accelerating uh, for uh, our business and try to to serve uh, society as we are very proud to do uh, today, but also to be sustainable for the future. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you. Um, just let me finish with this. I know that some of you um, have hurried because we had to finish this session before. But let me ask with two questions. The first one is going to be for Sasha and the last one with Professor. Um, that is a question that comes from the outside. And I promise you that in three minutes we'll be, we'll be off Sasha. Um, some, uh, in some way, we were saying, and some information published um, recently suggests that in certain way, global is growing in a very fast way, as it happens normally with, with platform economies and, and companies, um, becoming like a Swiss knife army platform uh, with inver investing of uh, $20 million um, on, on delivering all sorts of items from fashion to gadgets as Amazon, uh, having those dark stores, um, repairing with an R2G, um, as uh, also um, delivering books with an agreement with um, Casa del Libre in, in, in Catalonia and Spain, um, which is the next steps? I mean, how are you facing future, and especially after what we went through? Um, yeah, I mean, there's been a lot of news lately about, about that. Um, the reality is Global has been multi-category from day one. We're actually pretty much a pioneer in Europe about a multi-category. We've been doing groceries, uh, retail stores. I mean, you know, we've had bookshops we've worked with for yeah. a number of years. And what's happened, what I mentioned earlier, and I think this is, is an acceleration in all this uh, of ha habit of the consumer to, to suddenly order these things online and um, if they want them immediately, obviously to order them through a platform like Global. So, I mean, you know, for example, right now, um, food, but I'm not talking about restaurant food, so food related to supermarket, niche food stores, um, specific, you know, um, organic fruit and vegetables. These are the fastest growing category in, in Global right now, and not just Global. Um, consumers' habits have changed. That they weren't used to using these online and now. So to a certain extent, it's educating the market, which is one of the most difficult and maybe expensive and long-term things to do has, has happened very quickly. Um, a good example is, you know, uh, you know, wine stores in the city. Well, normally, you know, people would go and they'd walk a half a kilometre to order some wine. And with COVID, they, could, they couldn't do that, so they ordered it through Global. And they realised, wow, that's pretty useful. I mean, it's a, it's a big weight, it's six bottles, walking, you know, half a mile across the city, when actually I can order my favourite wine, which is pretty much the same wine every time, because I know which one I like. So why wouldn't I order that? And when you know we'll deliver it at more or less the same cost as me going myself. And that that I think that's what's happening. Um, so I think COVID's accelerated that. Um, and obviously we're we're fairly well positioned because um, you know we've been doing that for a number of years. Having said that, I mean we're still tiny um, compared to our competitors. I mean most of them are huge multinational giants with with a lot more valuation, a lot more um, funds than us. Um, well, so, you, you, you so we're are still tiny team. competing against the giants. Yeah, you're a giant and, and you're working really well. Um, last question quickly, and uh, I will ask you a short question, Professor Pisaridis, um, saying thank you very much for your time also here. Uh, it comes from the outside. Uh, it's this video that uh, we received from Karina Sp Spiltka. Uh, she's the president at A Digital. I'd like you to hear and answer, please. What is your recommendation on how to improve the digital education and what specific proposals can we include as part of the public policies to really impact in the competitiveness of our economy and also to make the best use of the next generation funds? Thanks so much. I know it's you not an easy question, but... You want, the, you want the one minute answer, do you? <laughs> Sorry for that, yeah. No, I mean, just highlight some uh, important keys uh, that you consider. Well, first of all, digital education. I think digital edu education is absolutely essential, but it should start very early, very, very early. In fact, we know from uh, recent uh, uh, research on the economics of education that the most effective education is one that begins with preschool and uh, carries on step by step. So ed education is it, it's a challenge for education is to find a way of making preschool children from age three, I mean, to be uh, conversant with um, with digital technologies and, and digital education and then carry on from there to move more and more uh, into more and more complicated. Now, I, I think the, the, the second part of the question is how, how do we make digital education to, uh, sorry, digital technologies uh, to improve our societies. There actually, I want to broaden that question a little bit as a, um, which I, I, I was just itching to go away, as it were, when uh, Songu was was speaking and also um, and also another speaker who I think was I think Ignacio I think it was probably uh, yeah, Ignacio, Ignacio. were saying that the company should take more more care of um, that the company should it should have objectives beyond you know when they're taking on the new technology beyond 
uh, just making more profit from the new technologies. They, they shouldn't be replacing labor, they should be pulling productivity, but at the same time expanding. I, I, you know, obviously, I believe that uh, very strongly. Um, and uh, the question is, how do you persuade companies to do it? I mean, obviously, some well-meaning CEOs might uh, impose it when times get hard or and in an AGM, there is pressure on them. How do you do it? I, I think the way to do it is to is to bring government in to, to provide incentives, either through regulation or even uh, even preferably to um, to, to give tax to, to adjust the taxes that companies pay on, on that basis. You know, if if, if a company it has the purpose or, or rather it brings in new technology which is replacing workers, then it should pay more tax <laughs> for, for the machine. Let, let, let's give that answer. I think that's, that's good. Uh, thank you very much uh, to all of you. It's, <laughs> it's been a pleasure to have you today with us, uh, Mr. Gul Togan. Uh, thank you very much uh, for joining us. It, it was absolutely great to listen to you. We would love to listen to all of you uh, for a much longer time. Uh, Jax Weber, thank you very much also for joining us. Uh, also to Ignacio Garcia Magarzo, thank you very much for joining us today. And Sasha Michaud, thank you very much also for joining us. Also to Jordi Wall, who's not right now here, but also join us for a while. And of course, um, Professor Pisaridis, thank you very much um, for, for sharing this knowledge, your time, your knowledge uh, with all of us. Uh, it's been a pleasure. This has been uh, this first, uh, let's say, mobile talk of this new series, but um, we'll keep on going the next um, weeks. We'll be talking about education, and in some weeks uh, we'll debate about it because we think it's a key topic. Thank you very much to all of you for uh, being today with us, for sharing this session. Share it across. I think it was really, really enriching. And thank you to uh, the Mobile World Capital Barcelona Foundation for making this effort and going deeply on the topics and not keeping a surface as, uh, as we're quite used to. Thank you very much, and I hope to see you soon. Thanks.